What is up? Welcome back to the channel. I am here today with yours truly. Elfie is in the house. It is Paranormal Podcast Day. Or wait, is it Handmaiden's Tale Day? I can't remember which one. No, Paranormal Day. It's definitely Paranormal Day, although it feels like we're living in a tale right now. Um, feels like the world's exploding around us and we're just kind of sitting here like floating on a rock in outer space. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I'm so excited for this stream today. Uh, this is a stream. Honestly, Elfie, haven't I been talking to you about this for like ever? Like since we became friends, like, like the first oh, yeah. thing I think I asked you about was Mothman. I was like... I, I envy Elfie. Like, I can't wait. Like, I really feel like this particular stream is going to be more on Elfie because not a lot of people have actually been to the location where they claim that Mothman resides. Um, and Elfie got to go and you get to hear the behind the scenes stuff. And I'm so excited because it's just so cool. And like, this is my hands down favorite crypto. What's your favorite crypto character, Elfie? Uh, honestly, I definitely like Mothman since I've been there a couple of times and I like the legend. But I think one of my favorites is the Jersey Devil. That really? one's still is it okay? Yeah, that's also that's one of the places I want to go back to. Like, I want to check that place out more thoroughly. Right, man. I'm so jealous. So jelly belly. So you got to go to the Mothman area. Okay. This is like amazing shit. Like I had this stream. I feel like I've been waiting to do the stream for like ever like before I even knew you I was ready to do this stream so um first of all I mean there's so much to go in but let's just start off asking do you think he's real I think there was something there mm -hmm. like I definitely think like I'm not sure if it was quite what they described but I think there was something there was a cryptid there of some kind Ugh. because it's apparently just that area alone is just all the strangeness strangeness <laughs> So Mothman, he like goes way, way back um, to literally 1966. This is Point Pleasant, which honestly, like I remember when I started doing research years ago on Mothman, doesn't just the name like Point Pleasant sound creepy? It, it sounds like something out of like one of those like Goosebump books or something. Or like a Vampire Diaries episode or something like <laughs> it is. It's like Point Pleasant, you know, and this place exists and they actually still today like worship him because he's seen there most often. Um, there's so many theories behind it. I can't wait to get into it, but there's a museum. Have you been to the museum of Mothman? Yes. You have. Yeah. I actually got to go there and everything. It's really cool actually, because it? it's a mix of the, the case itself, but also the Mothman prophecy movie that came out early 2000s. Is it big? Like what, what would you like compare like the, the, the museum? Is it large or is it just kind of like, you know, okay. I wouldn't say it's big. It's like, um, it looks like the the building they use for it, because this was a while ago, so I don't know if they've added to it since last I've been there. But mm -hmm. when I was there, it was about like, it was about the size of your, like a general store, like an Ace General store, one level, but it was like packed full stuff. Like they had all sorts of oddities and, and evidence and this, that, and the other, and lots of newspaper clippings and everything. Like the, the, Museum definitely just was filled with stuff. But yeah, I would say about the size of general store, give or take. So uh, this just kind of like randomly popped in my head. Do you mm -hmm. think that when you have, because like they literally have a shrine for Mothman. Like they have an actual, uh, right? Have you seen the statue? Like there's like a, a I don't see. Uh, I <laughs> mean, that, oh my God. To me, I don't think that's what he looks like personally, but whatever, you know. But like, do you think when you have a Mothman location. Mothman works out. I, <laughs> he's fit. Except there was like, a meme. Yeah for a while I don't know if you saw it. they had like a picture of Mothman's butt or, like it was a meme and like it was just yes, like I remember it was like this turned in like insect butt and like everyone was making fun of him for it and I was like but like do you think when you have a museum who is literally collecting every single piece of everything including a shrine do you think that attracts it to that location I can see where with something like that it might 
because we're not sure what we're dealing with. I mean, it could be a humanoid, it could be interdimensional, it could be alien, it could be even like go into the realm of the occult stuff. So, but I can definitely see where like you're kind of adding energy to it as you have people going to it. I mean, you have the Mothman Festival, you have the museum, you have people taking pictures at the statue. So it probably can like feed into the energy if there is anything there. I mean, it keeps everything going and whatnot. So I, I wouldn't be surprised, but also I can see maybe Mothman, him, like the creature themselves, might want to be just left alone too. <laughs> like, stop it, just stop it. A lot like the Bigfoot theory of like, they just don't want to interact with humans at all. Like, I can't say I blame them. He's honestly. like, I don't blame them. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Like, I, we were texting in group chat today and we were like, the, the energy's weird today. Why is everybody acting weird? And we're all like, we don't like people. All three of us are like, <laughs> I'm just done. I'm just done. I'm just done. <laughs> so Mothman, seven feet tall. So that's large mm-hmm. compared to like a human. You know, like a normal guy is like the highest is what, six one ish. So about another yeah, foot uh, on top of that. Okay. Yeah. Twelve foot wingspan, that's massive. But what he's known for is the glowing red eyes, gray in appearance, but it's always usually nighttime. Or if he's yeah, like well, flying, it's like black. You know, he looks black or gray or whatever. The one yeah, the one appearance, uh, the one woman did get pretty up and close, up close and personal. She said, and it, she described it a slightly gray, feathery feather appearance to it mm, okay. from what she saw. Though I'm not like I'm like if you saw something that's seven feet tall with a wingspan like that, I don't know how much inf- how much you would be taking it other than wanting to get away from there. True, <laughs> like well, I, that means she saw texture, right? Like she saw yeah. texture. But it's he was that close. She saw the texture. But it's interesting if they they call him Mothman, and if he they saw feathers. It's interesting they refer to Mothman rather than not like Birdman or something. You know what I mean? Like I feel like if you would, you would think of feathers, the first thing you think of is a bird. Yeah, and that's why I find it strange. Now, like they talk about in the reports and stuff, like the newspaper dubbed it Mothman and stuff because there was it was in the sixties and uh, Batman. The TV show was pretty big then, so mm-hmm. it was like Batman, Mothman. They're like, oh, creature of the night. Let's go with Batman, uh, Mothman instead. Right. So they and I think it was because of confused. the large glowing eyes. Right. The red eyes. Bird-like mm-hmm. creature. Okay, so Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Um, this is like pretty much on the coast. Isn't Point Pleasant like on the coast? I, think I don't think so. I looked it up the other day, and I was like, I have to see this, because like, I'm going to peek at it again. It- because it's it's not far from the Pennsylvania border and also Ohio border, and that's actually where you see reports coming out of Ohio. Oh, okay, you're right. Because basically, yeah. when you're right across the river from Ohio, because I remember we would be in Ohio, and we crossed the river, and then we're in West Virginia and everything, because from where I am, it's about three hours away, so it's not very far, so it's kind of near almost like three borders of states my brain for some reason thought it was like like Mar- like closer to maryland i guess my brain was right there but yeah i bet i've driven right through there i can't believe i never stopped because like i've been oh, road tripping mean, through there technically speaking if you look at it like without the mothman and stuff it's a small uh working town it's it's ones that you pass by almost every time when you're traveling through and everything like without the mothman you probably wouldn't even really like take notice of it you drive by it mm-hmm. I'm looking up stats on it right now. So, um, 2010 census for Point Pleasant was only 4,350 people. And yeah, it's I highly not doubt big. it for yeah. much more since. Well, 2019, the population actually decreased. <laughs> so it's 4,146. So oh, it's. Wow, it got smaller. Yeah, it did. It got smaller by 300 people. So that's well, really interesting. Yeah, because I remember, like, okay, when, when I went to. When we went to Point Place and everything, um, there was the main road strip and everything, which had all the the shops like the Mothman Museum, the diner. Uh, I think there was like an antique shop. Did you go in the diner? Up. I would say I think so. I think I'm we went into the diner. Elfie, it's cute. It was like very Mothman UFO themed. Elfie and everything. is it was our. Very long I say I'm the supreme. I'm not okay. 
<laughs> Elfie is, I bow to Elfie because she's done the coolest shit, like, ever. Like, I literally could just listen to Elfie for hours on the things she's done. So what is the, like, the vibe in the town? Like, what does it feel? Does it feel like a small town? Does it feel cryptid? Does it feel haunted? You know what I mean? Like, what's the vibe? Oh, I know what you mean. Um, it felt, it, it definitely felt very strange. I mean, it's a small town. It has that very small town feel. It's almost like, okay, like, if you ever watched, like, a Stephen King movie or, like, even X-Files mm-hmm. and they've had to investigate those tiny towns, like, there's always, like, I feel like it's one of those towns where everyone knows everyone and mm-hmm. everyone's in everyone's business, too. Mm-hmm. It definitely felt like that because I had the feeling, like, when we went there, it was like, no one can keep a secret. Probably everyone knew what we were there, doing right. there. Right, okay. And we were all there. I have a question because <laughs> I've experienced this in, in small towns. Um... So you're there with the film crew and you're the, like, my eyelash is falling off. I think, I don't know what's going on here. It was one of those days. Um, I went to this small town. Oh my God. Well, I went to a few of them. One was 400, um, 400 people. So very teeny. And then the small. other one was 900. And like, so you were, but 4,000, that's still small, you know? Yeah. Was it one of those places when you walk in, you've got a full film crew and you're it's like a thing, you know, like it's probably like the, one of the biggest things that happens there is everybody watching you and like their eyes are on you to see like what's going on and like questioning it. I think to some extent, I mean, like granted this place was already used to people coming in and investigating the case and even the Mothman festival itself. So they were kind of used to, camera crews probably come in and doing the usual oh it's around Halloween it's around the anniversary okay let's do this and everything but it was definitely one of those when we would talk to people I felt like if I remember correctly everyone was like oh yeah you're you're here for Mothman right. and like there were some people were like I feel like almost like they had memorized their already what they were going to say because they got the usual like 20 questions of what they thought about Mothman were you ever witness what do you think of this place what do you think of the curse the so on and so forth so they already had their answers already so it's like because when you go investigate there's like still a few witnesses still alive and they've been probably talked to a hundred times and they're like (laughs) yep let's do this i'm ready let's do this again (laughs) right they're like yeah i know what i'm talking about it's like i was thinking about though earlier before we like chatted about this i was like oh my god remember when we talked about loch ness and how loch ness is literally like their economy like they have to have that for their economy I assume it's similar with Mothman, don't you think? Oh, yeah, totally. I think Mothman is definitely one of their, like, cornerstones of their um, tourist economy and everything. Because, if I remember correctly, we had to go over the river to the other side, technically, I think, in Ohio, Mm -hmm. to stay at a hotel there. Really? Because I don't think there was any hotels on that side of town, if I remember correctly. Or at least not ones big enough and everything. Because I remember we had to cross back and forth on a bridge right. um, a few times and whatnot. I'm looking at the So map it wasn't again. a very big town, so like that was that is their moneymaker right there is Mothman. Wow. It's kind of like, so I've been to, if you go like a little further, obviously this is West Virginia, but up into Kentucky on like south side of like uh, Cincinnati, um, there's a, the river. And so on one side is um, Cincinnati. You have the river, the highway, and then you have Wilder, Kentucky. Wilder Kentucky's where Bobby Mackey's is. So I've been there and it's so strange because well, Wilder's like literally four blocks long. Like not even kidding. Like yeah, like people are like, Oh, let's it. go to Bobby Mackey's. I'm like, okay, you realize like it's the middle of nowhere. Like, I mean you can go to Cincinnati, yeah. but it's it's a drive. Like I'm not talking like a little river, like that though that river is massive and it takes a minute to get over that river, you know, like over the bridge. But Wilder's so little, too. It's the same. Like, I've had people that are like, oh, I'm going to stay. Like, we haven't booked a hotel yet, but I'm going to go stay somewhere by Bobby Mackey's. I'm like, there is nowhere to stay. Like, what what hotel? Where is that hotel? (laughs) You're either in Lexington, which is like an hour and a half south, or like, you'll have to go to Cincinnati. And people are like, oh, there's no way. There's got to be a hotel. Like, there is no hotel. Like, you understand these small towns. When you've been, like, and that's why I wanted to ask you what the vibe was in the town, because I've been to small towns to film where you're talking, like, like I said, 400 population, 900 max, and they will, like, we were filming B-roll in this one area downtown, Paoni, Colorado, I've talked about it before, and they literally called the the police on us. Oh, no. Yeah. 
and the police showed up and you're allowed to legally like you as a producer you have to know where you can film in like public areas public access access like um streets or uh sidewalks or parks like you can anybody can film there you don't have to have a permit Mm -hmm. to film those places but um they get in your face because they don't know what you're doing and they don't want you so it is that's why i had to ask like wilder's kind of weird like that like it's literally four blocks long like, I remember Wanda, before she passed for Bobby Mackey's, she was like, let me show you around the town. And it was like, okay. And it was like a four-block radius. Walk up the street and back down the street. There you go. And that was it. She's like, and that's my house there. And then and I'm like, wow, that was that was a great tour. You know what I mean? But it, it blows people's minds when you haven't been to places. Like, even 4,000 small. Like, metro area of Vegas is millions, you know what I mean? Like, you're thinking of oh, yeah. 4,000 people. You're right. Everybody knows everybody, literally. Oh, yeah. And a lot of these people, I believe a lot of them were our families and family members. Because, like, when you talk to them, a lot of them, even if there's not many witnesses still alive today, there are, there are relatives, there's family members that remember, there are people that are related. I mean, a lot of them have been, have multiple generations there. So, it's a very, t- usually tight-knit town, and I'm... I'm it's very interesting because like where I live, it's like you have kind of like state college area, but then when you go outside of it, you got little like pockets of towns similar to this that you pass by and you will, if you blink, you miss it. So it's not, Oh yeah. So a lot of these, and I noticed too, I noticed a lot of people probably like if they didn't work at like the few places that were in the town, a lot of them probably commuted outside town to find work and everything because I can't remember what originally the town was did and whatnot, but that had kind of died down. So the the Mothman stuff came about just the right time to kind of bring it back to life, essentially. It's funny you're saying that because I just decided to look up Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Like every major city has like a city page, you know, which is like here's about the city and the population and what to expect. And if you literally scroll through this, the first major thing that you're going to see after all of the like text is the Mothman statue. <laughs> like, literally, yep. it's right there. So you can tell that it's definitely... Uh, there. It looks cute, though. They have little, you're right, boutiques, little... I did notice it looks like it could be a fairly religious town, though, because I saw some, like, quote, Bible stores that were in the area. I don't know if you remember that. Does it seem like a religious town? I mean, it's, it's a small town and everything. I wouldn't be surprised. And I honestly wouldn't mind going back there just to see what has happened and if it's grown and all because I do remember there were a few more shops the last time I was there because I've been there three times at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I oh think my, three jealous. times. Oh, jealous. Mothman I Festival still haven't gone to year. a festival yet, though. Yeah, September 17th and 18th. I would love oh. to go. I would love to go. Three hours isn't that bad. That's not too bad no. of a drive. Oh, no. I mean, the, the worst part, though, is... Um, Depending on what road you go through, you do end up kind of going through the mountains and the twisty roads and everything. So it's not quite a straight shot. <laughs> so winter wouldn't be a good time to, to go in that area, probably. It was cold. Is that still Smoky <laughs> Mountains area or is that not quite Smoky Mountains? Uh, that's I think that's still part of the Appalachian Mountains, is it? Okay. too. Like you, you do run in through kind of like weaving in and out of the Appalachian Mountains to get there and everything. Which I've been fascinated with those lately, too, with cryptoids. So this is really cool. Oh, my God, yeah. TikTok. (laughs) Have you seen TikTok is blowing up with, like, cryptoids and, like, the Appalachian Mountains and, like, the Smoky Mountains? and There are people that live in the area. We need to do a stream on it. I'm planning on doing it eventually, but... um, The locals are probably like, what are you talking about? Of course we have cryptids. What else is new? (laughs) These people on TikTok that I found, they're like, Oh, yeah, we have Bigfoot, and we learned that you don't go outside when it's dark. And if you leave your phone in your car, well, it's staying there till morning. And I'm just like, whoa. Like, they're not joking. And they put, they lock oh, up their yeah. animals in the barn. And, like, that, and you, if you don't, you don't leave your horses out after dark. And, like, I'm just like, wow, this is, like, deep, you know? Oh, yeah, the Appalachian Mountains get very interesting. Like, I live on the edge of mountains, but I don't, like, live in the mountains like there's a definite difference between like i'm in the valley mm-hmm. of center county but then there's a difference between being in the valley and then being in the mountains that's a whole different ball of wax and it does there's so many different folklore and cryptids and creatures and they're like yep that's that's just a thing and it is it's very like like i said i've found these people on tiktok and they're just like as a matter of fact it is a thing you know what i mean 
but oh, my yeah. dad owned property and I've, I've had to go to these properties, um, over the years that we, they're still in the family in, um, uh, I guess you would call the foothills of the Appalachian mountains in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say what okay. town. And I've had to go to these properties to check on them and stuff. And, um, it's not just cryptoids you need to worry about. It's some of the people. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's the smaller town areas. It just... It's not just the towns. There's actual people. What did Kat call? The mountain people The mountain everything. people. Yeah, Kat yeah. talks about there's people in Vermont that live that way, too. Like, in the mountains, like, off the grid. Not even mm-hmm. in a house. And, like, this is where you, you get the whole conspiracy theory of that they're, like, camping out in, in the parks. And they're, like, the savage, like, people that are, like cannibals or whatever but I don't I mean I I think that's getting a little steep but I will say that there are yeah it can be unsafe I will say that especially knowing yeah there's there's definitely like uh, mountain people and up in the Pennsylvania Appalachian mountains and everything it's usually one of those like you kind of have to use your common sense like if you see a dirt road going off somewhere and says private property don't go don't go just Mm -hmm. just don't (laughs) well and, and not even that other creatures too i know we want to get back to mothman but another example is we were filming on set with cat and we found a like cave off to the side this was in arizona we were hiking up this trail and like because there was quartz everywhere it was ridiculous there was just quartz embedded in the ground it was beautiful but we kept hiking up this trail and we got into um and, and once again no car access like this is all on foot and we mm. found a couple of caves, and we swore we heard people or something talking up there. You know what I mean? And I was like, no, okay. don't go in there. Like, we don't know what's in there. We don't want to piss anybody off and get shot. Like, whatever. You know what I mean? And um, yeah. even Kat was like, danger, danger. Turn around. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so I'm just warning you guys, like, be safe and think before you do things. Mm. Because, and maybe it is not a human, you know, to be worried about, like, maybe it's an animal or maybe it is weird people that are camped out living in there that are cannibals. I don't know. So, um, yeah, but when you get densely foresty mountains, yeah, you don't know what to expect. You don't know what's been living up there forever. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, we still have wildlife. We have wild preserves and we have dense forests up here, especially if you go further north and whatnot that are. You're close to Penn State still, right? Yeah, we're close to the center center of Pennsylvania, but when you go further up north and you really start hitting the mountains and the dense forests, we have, like, wildlife preserves and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have a huge caving and caving explorers in the area, too. I mean, because... What is that called? Spl- there... Splunking or something? Split on yeah, sp- spl- spl- spelunking, spl- I think. Yeah. Wow, yeah. <laughs> sorry. But there's still cave trails that are being found. I mean, they still find routes through the caves, Every year, there's always new ones being found, and there are people who actively, like, go through and some believe that there's uh, cave tunnels that would probably take you from one end to Appalachian Mountains all the way down to the end of it and everything. Oh, man. Yeah, uh, Larry just said the hills have eyes. That's how Kat explains it. Oh, God, it. no. Yeah, no, thank you. Kat says good. <laughs> you have to be safe with some areas of Vermont because she lives in uh, New Hampshire, and it's sort of the same. There's just... Like you said, you see a dirt road that leads to nowhere, be very careful, you know. <laughs> just don't. <laughs> going that direction, if you know what I'm saying. Because you just don't know what to expect. It's true. Okay, and so make I'm, sure you have a vehicle that actually can take a dirt road, too. <laughs> yeah, how do you feel about, just a random question, how do you feel about, like, you know, if you're investigating filming cryptoids or, or any of anything, really, do you think it's safe to take weapons with you? I'm not saying a particular weapon, but do you think you should take armed something even if it's like a knife i mean i could definitely see it's one of those where i feel like because most of the time when you talk about cryptozoology and everything most of the time i feel like people should take some classes in one self-defense but also in uh wilderness <laughs> self-defense survival. against i i might well, come up with, on a like, yeti i have to make sure i can black belt that shit you know what i mean <laughs> But also, like, wilderness survival, too, because yeah. most times people are like, yeah, I'm going after a Bigfoot. It's like, you know there might be bears out there uh-huh. that will maul you before a Bigfoot even ever comes your way. Or a moose stampeding you, for Yeah, sure. oh my god, the moose are worse. Yeah, the moose are but, yeah. worse. Yeah, will... moose, deer, bears, like, just, like, the wildlife in general, though, most of the time they want to stay away from people, but if you get in their territory 
and you piss them off somehow, it's like wilderness survival would probably be a good thing to take a few classes in doing cryptozoology if you're going like full into the woods and everything. But also just survival in the woods, like camping, very basic, like basically like Boy Scout stuff Mm -hmm. so that you don't end up like falling off the side of a cliff while you're trying to look for a Bigfoot. Right. I, I do get worried about that, too, when you think about it, mm-hmm. because you, I think, I think in some of these... around with expensive equipment. <laughs> maybe that, too, and tons of people, your whole crew with you, you're responsible. Mm-hmm. But I've been to locations where um, you, it, I don't know how to explain it. I guess, I don't, and maybe you can confirm this, where it feels outdoor, especially, is like vortexes or like portals. Yeah. And I've been to locations where we're investigating and we get lost and we're not even far and it, it's not on oh, purpose. Yeah. It's just, it's the portal or the energy in the air and you get completely like discombobulated and yeah. you literally like camp. And you're right. What do you do if there's an emergency and you have to like camp out for the night or something? What do you do? Oh yeah. Come equipped. You have to be back. Also it's like, it's so easy. Honestly, if you, especially if you're in, um, virgin forests or like very, un um, camped, forces like forces woods that aren't usually used in trails and stuff like if you go off the trail if you go deeper in the woods and everything that's when you can really get uh, disoriented or turned around and it's one of those like you should know some basic like following the stars or ways to get out of there alive because it's not like just going on a trail and you just follow the trail to the end you're good you most of the time when people do their like cryptozoology searches they're going off the trail deep in the woods i mean uh, earlier when i was talking about um jersey devil the um pine barrens some of the pine barrens has not even been fully explored because it's so dense and so um rugged and everything that people haven't completely explored the area or know what's there so there's a lot of uh, possibility of danger just from the environment and not even worrying about anything running into you or whatnot so it's one of those like Common sense. <laughs> I agree. This is why, I mean, and I love Mothman. And if reflective I got, gear. <laughs> if I got, yeah, reflective gear and, like, some yarn with Cat so that you can just, like, mark everywhere you walked. Cat, we need your yarn. <laughs> Finally, we have a, a necessary need for your yarn. But, um, uh, that's crocheting what, something. I, like we needed the yarn for some cat's crocheting Bigfoot, that scarf, you know what I mean, over in the corner. Like, cat, we need the yarn. Yeah, we needed that yarn. <laughs> what are you doing with it? Um, <laughs> But that's why, I, I mean, I would do it. I would absolutely go investigate Mothman. But I really don't like outdoor locations for this reason. And it's because you get lost. It's dark. I, I've done outdoor locations. That's why. So, And you have to be careful. You don't know what the wind is going to sound like over EVPs and when you're trying to film. And, like, there was, I told you I went to this one haunted location in Colorado Springs. And it was off the trail. And it was a hike. And it was a, it was a hard you're right. You're carrying equipment. It's a lot of physical, you know, that you have to do physically prepare your body for. You're right. Sliding down mountains happens. It absolutely happens. Like Josh Gates. Oh, I can only imagine what he, oh God, the insurance on that alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Their liability is like 18 million just in case. You know what I mean? I mean, I remember a few times. Okay. I, I apparently, because being the witch is like will chuck you into the woods your witch will talk to you whatever um there were so many times i was thrown into the woods and everything and the wood like you said the woods is difficult to film like audio is a pain in the neck it is i mean because you're trying to they're, they're trying to catch you talking they're trying to catch your audio but also trying to make up for the fact that even if it doesn't seem like it's windy with the mics and everything you know how it's like the mics will pick up everything the cricket farts you'll hear it 100 oh yeah. yeah so then you, you like hear like because then you have like the camera crew trying like off in the distance trying to be out of the way not in, <laughs> on, on i'm laughing because it's so true and then they're like and they're, and they're like stepped like, on the like, branch like, sorry that was me oh you're yeah like, was it bigfoot like you know try not to move uh-huh. and then you're freezing and everything yep. 
Because, like, you're not bundled up enough, and, like, after so long being outside, you're cold. And then you're hot. But then they're like, okay, we yeah. need to do EVP session. It's like, my teeth are chattering. Uh-huh. I can't do it. It's true. <laughs> it's so true. I'm s- and that's why I, outdoor locations aren't my favorite. I would do it, though. I would absolutely do it. I would it- love pay for it. I love the idea because there's so many cases outdoors, but on the other hand, it's, like, such a pain in it. Well, it's that's like, like, we like need Island to- of the I- Dolls. I would love to do that, but, oh, my God. We have to take a boat in. But think about that. With an entire crew and all the equipment, oh, my God. Whoa. It oh, just yeah. exhausts me thinking about it. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, you'd have to go in bare minimum, but you still need certain things. Where do we charge everything? <laughs> you'd have to try to take a generator. generator. Yeah, see? Yep. Oh, yeah. And then you have I to get all the lighting When Ghost and Adventures and... went, it was like they had to take, like, 12 trips back or something. Like, And, yeah, you're right. I, I mean, can't believe it. And then the mosquitoes, like you have to think ahead of everything. Then the bugs dropping from the dolls, like yeah, I mean you have to think ahead big time. And then if you get stranded also, out the there, here. yep, a tent, like literally, and like oh god, the pain. It's so much easier just to go to indoor location. But then again, you're right, you do catch really cool stuff. Okay, so let's oh, talk yeah. about Mothman. So the very first experience of Mothman was 1966. Do you want to talk about it? All right, so. With Mothman, like, it's a very short window because it's between 1966 and 1967. So, 1966, November 12th, five men nearby the town of Plandian were digging a grave, apparently. And they reported seeing a man-like shadow flying overhead. So, this is, like, apparently the first, like, documented sighting of it that people said and everything. So, it's like, they were digging a grave and they see this big shadow fly over or whatnot. But it's not until... November 15th, where we get the the more famous one, the one that everyone more talks about, which is the the couples, Roger and Linda Scarberry and Steve Mary Mallet, who were chased by basically the six, the, the seven foot tall giant wingspan flying creature near the TNT area. That's the, the big one that everyone talks about mostly. Mm-hmm. And this one, mm. I just, I don't know. Roger and Linda Scareberry. <laughs> like what a like it, it's that it's that old thing of like there's no coincidence. You know what I mean? Like they were right where they needed to be at that time with that last name Scareberry, and Mothman was like, "There's the Scareberries. Let's go down and see what they're doing." Um, yeah, apparently they were they were driving down. I can't remember if they were like uh, I think they were heading back home or something, and they just see basically they they did would describe um, I believe behind them this large wingspan creature and these glowing red eyes and they're just chasing it uh being chased by i guess what surprised me more was the fact was how low it was and how much it was able to keep pace with the vehicle and they were going like 50 miles an hour 55 miles an hour and was just like keeping pace with them and everything that i would want to see honestly like Mm -hmm. i would be in awe of it i'd be in awe of it and this is the tnt area so this is the area that you got to go investigate yeah oh yeah um that place is cool i would definitely go back there maybe in more pleasant weather but i definitely go back there. yeah spill it like i want to this is like i know we have more to talk about but i want to hear it like throw me because i'm sitting here dying for this story i want to hear about it from start to beginning i'm i'm ready to go or start to finish i'm ready it was okay so like is it big how far out of point pleasant is it you know what i mean like what's it like if I remember correctly, it was a little bit far out way out from the town, Point Pleasant, because uh, the last time when we went there, we kind of went, like, took a side trip because we were heading uh, to another event, and we're like, hey, we're passing by Point Pleasant, let's go check it out. And it was, like, summertime, so it was a little more nicer weather we could go out and about. So it was a bit of a drive from the town itself. And then when um, the TNT area is actually a very large area like it's uh how many acres like six thousand acres something crazy like is it really yeah originally started eight thousand three hundred twenty acres wow. and the um wildlife preserve that it was turned into i think uses about six uh two thousand seven hundred of that acres so they turned into a wildlife preserve so that's the area that we were in they were checking out because that's where you found would find what they called the igloos. Right. And what they were were basically these um, large, 
uh, concrete mounds that were covered in grass and such to kind of camouflage them during their use in World War II. And they were used to keep the, the TNT and ammunition during uh, their use during the war and everything. Are they, so, like, you say you're on, like, like, this portion of it is, like, a wildlife refuge. Is it yeah. very secluded where these are? Um, it's definitely off the beaten path, if I remember correctly. Like, we had to go off the main road, and then you, you hit a dirt road, and then you're, like, driving forever before you finally get to the area where you then start seeing, like, um, some of the igloos, but then you also see the the leftover buildings the concrete buildings like it's definitely it's kind of cool looking because it's like these um industrial buildings that like nature has kind of taken over and also um the wildlife preserve has been keeping some of it while they've been cleaning up as well okay and there was like active bombs there or something right and they had to clean part of them up that's why part of it's not accessible there might be like ammunition or something they're not really sure is like what i think i read online i think they had to do some cleaning what was their main concern was there was still contamination from the uh making of the ammunition mm. that uh, mm-hmm. in the 80s was it 80s i think yeah in the 80s they they did like soil tests and water tests and they found it was very high contamination so this is why it became um, a little a bit like Chernobyl, fight. except not the same way, but like very... not not quite that level, right. but like it was definitely. <laughs> I would like to go there glowing. too. I'm fascinated but it... by that too. Oh yeah, and nature had already started taking over, but they just they just noticed there was still a lot of contamination there, so they had put a lot of funding into trying to clean it up and trying to correct the damage basically made so the the little huts do they seem stable still like when you were there yeah they were they were pretty still solid and everything um when we went inside one of them there was obviously uh leakage because there was like water in some spots of it there was also i think cans or canisters kicking around too Mm -hmm. if they they weren't like completely cleaned out i mean there wasn't like any ammunition or anything (laughs) like that but there was like like debris because you could kind of tell that obviously people have probably gone there mm-hmm. and hung out and you know the usual like hangout party. place and everything mm-hmm. oh yeah totally obviously people had used it for party and everything mothman's like yeah um, this is exactly where i want to be with you people no, just <laughs> it was they were so cold though like we would go we what went time inside. Of year did you go um i want to say it was fall to winter mm-hmm. is when we were filming That's if cold. i remember correctly mm-hmm. And it was so cold in there. Like, we were pretty well bundled. Like, all, all of us had, like, pretty heavy jackets. But just standing in there, and there's absolutely no insulation. You have concrete around you and everything. Mm-hmm. It felt even colder inside the, the igloos than it was outside of them and everything. Mm-hmm. And then you had to deal with also, we had, like, you have tall grass everywhere. I mean, it is literally a wildlife hunting preserve and everything. So it's, like, tall grass, forests. You, you hopefully don't get lost and forget where the trail was to get back to the cars and everything. Mm-hmm. But it was still really cool because it was it was so quiet in some ways because we were out of the way. We weren't near any of the towns. And you could hear, like, the, some of the wildlife and whatnot and just very open sky. Mm-hmm. And clear, probably not with any of the pollutants oh, yeah. from the... Yeah, I bet it was gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, do you think you experienced anything there that may have been outer worldly? I don't think I did. I don't remember experiencing anything. I was more just like, I thought, I remember both, I went there at night when we investigated, and when we last went to Point Pleasant during the daytime, um, I don't think we got to go to one of the igloos, but we got to be outside. And during the daytime, it's very calm and very it had a very nice feeling to it. Like, it was just, if I'd lived nearer to it, I could see myself just kind of walking around and checking out the place more often. I mean, honestly, some of the stone structures, if I remember correctly, look like, like, really cool, like, photo shoots. Oh, yeah. Like, this would be really neat. I would love to take some more photos. <laughs> Witchy <laughs> photo shoot. Here we come. Oh, totally. It was, like, very, like, post-apocalyptic concrete walls and everything. Wow. 
but it was very calm and lovely. Like during the daytime, like at night, it definitely had a spookiness about it because you have these like huge mounds, and they almost looked like I, I don't know if you're familiar with like fairy mounds and such mm -hmm. and the folklore of that. Mm -hmm. They almost looked like that, and like. <laughs> So you like walk out of one of them and you're expecting someone to sort of walk out of their hut too, like in a creepy oh, way. Oh yeah, definitely. It was just, the, at night it definitely had a spooky feel when you were in the main area, the TNT area and whatnot. And it just like, I I remember feeling like slightly the, the feeling of maybe being watched or like, okay, maybe something's watching, but I didn't feel like, I felt cold, but I didn't feel like, it felt bad. It was more like, Huh, something might be taking interest, but just observing or something. Mm -hmm. Well, especially if you're in its space. But so, does it seem like a place that would be able to harbor something like a Mothman? I could see it harboring like something of because I feel like if with the Mothman, I'm not sure if I would classify it as an alien or maybe even something older, like something part of the land itself, like um. A nature spirit or something and with that area being reclaimed by nature and everything i could definitely uh see something of that land either the nature spirits of reclaiming it and kind of taking back over what it is and, and making it their own again mm -hmm. so i could definitely see that possibility yeah i don't know how i feel about it either i think he exists though but, you know, there's theories behind it, which we'll get into it. Like, some people say he, like, shows up before major accidents happen, which we have some of those, too. And then some people say, like, he's the cause of the accidents. Like, they saw him before the 9-11 um, happened, and, like, he was, like, warning people, or was he, like, directing the plane where to go? I don't think it's that. I, I do think it's more of a protective energy than, like, a doomsday sort of energy. Um... You're right, though. It does seem more like uh, almost um, indigenous in a way, maybe um, shamanistic type of thing, like for sure. Totem, maybe. Maybe a spirit totem, an animal totem or something like that. Like a protector of the land mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I could definitely see that because honestly, too, if you look at the cryptids, there's so many ones, even just in the East Coast area to Midwest area that a lot of them will have um, stories connecting them that go further back to um, indigenous area and whatnot that will describe something similar and that usually they are protectors or that they're guardians of the, of the land. Well, in this particular area, for example, the TNT area, which was used for obviously World War II, they say cryptids that are alien creatures don't like war against each other. So it makes you wonder if it chose this spot to sort of cancel out the negativity of war. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't want the land to be injured anymore. Like, you're right, very spiritual grounding. Um, when you're talking about indigenous culture, which is my culture, is you worship everything. Like, I know you, my family, if you would hunt bow and arrow style, you used the entire animal. You didn't waste an, an inch of the animal. You used the skin, you used the bone, and you also give like very big gratitude to your ancestors and your, your tribe for being able to provide them food from this creature. It's, it's a very like spiritual practice. And that's sort of how I like, I interpret the Mothman is very, you're right, very like earthy and like protective of creatures Be who knows, who knows what. Um, okay, so let's go back to the notes where I leave off. Um, so sister in law, right? November, so then, let's see here. This November 16th was when we talked earlier about the, the basically the titling of Mothman and everything. So that was when the newspaper says, Couple see man sized bird creature something. <laughs> Couple saw something weird, it wasn't human, and but this blew up. This blew up. It was on newsstands oh, yeah. everywhere. It blew up. This this would be a big. I mean, because like even back then, even if there if there was like an industrial, um, because you had the TNT area and you had a uh, working area, something like that on the front page would catch everyone's attention. Because you have to think too, they didn't have social media back then. They only mm -hmm. your your news was mostly through either like the 
late night TV news or your newspaper. So like everyone probably read this. Everyone knew exactly who these people were and everything. And everyone was talking. Mm -hmm. Well, even beyond Point Pleasant. I mean, I'm sure it was just a fire beyond there. It was probably Mm -hmm. worldwide. Oh, yeah. I can see. Because the other thing, too, when I was researching everything, I totally forgot. It's like the 1960s were definitely a big time for the the UFO sightings, alien sightings, um, alien abductions. And then you also have cryptos and everything. So this was a big time for people talking about this very subject. So to see this in your local paper would be a big deal. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating. I'm fascinated Mm -hmm. by it. So everybody says it's over six feet tall. Um, Now these people start getting uh, interviewed on all these TV stations, obviously. Yeah. And then um, it it was, it wasn't until a little bit later that he was dubbed Mothman. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So now we're going to fast forward December 15th, 1967. This is another famous thing that happened with Mothman, which is the famous bridge collapse, silver bridge collapse. Um, Basically, this is where the conspiracies start with Mothman of either A, he's an omen, and he's like, people die when they see him, or B, he's a good figure trying to warn people before it happens. Oh, yeah, and that's why I find it interesting, because, like, before that, when you read some of the accounts of the witnesses, they just talk about large flying creature uh, flying overhead or flying nearby, or they see it and everything. Uh, they'll encounter it, it frees them, but nothing really necessarily dangerous. Like, they don't necessarily talk about it attacking them. It's more like it comes near them, it, it flies by them or anything, or they witness it but they don't really talk about anything of it trying to hurt them. But like you said, yeah, then you have the 1967 Silver Bridge collapse, and then suddenly someone decides to put two and two together and like, oh, there has to be a connection now. Well, this was also when the famous picture was captured, right? Which is basically looks like there's a creature mm-hmm. under the under the bridge side or like hanging on the bridge side. And yeah, it was captured yeah. before the bridge collapsed. A lot of people died, didn't they? 46 people died on that bridge? Yep, 46 people um, in their vehicles trying to cross bridge as in basically just like fell into the river. God, that'd be a horrible death, wouldn't it? And I think it was the collapse failure single eye bar suspension chain was the defect that caused the, the collapses to happen. Yeah, the whole bridge collapsed. Wow, I'm just reading it too. Um, Bridge was carrying too much heavy load, so it was basically people were driving across this bridge during rush hour traffic. And then because of this defect of how it was built, it collapsed. God, that's horrible. That'd be horrifying to watch happen, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. And I mean, I mean, there's there's been footage like of, I think there was a, I think it was San Francisco where you see a bridge and it, it's during winds and you see it twisting and everything. So something almost similar to effect. But yeah, there'd be people on both sides of the bridge, the bridge who've already crossed over about to seeing suddenly this part of the bridge just fall away mm-hmm. and everything. And like, I could just only imagine like you don't really probably compute of what just happened mm-hmm. and everything. And yeah. it's just like, I, I can't even imagine what that'd be like. You, uh, yeah, well, and but then, if, you know, I feel like when tragedy happens like that, like, it's easier to blame something or someone. So on the negative side of the Mothman is like, oh, he's an omen. He caused the bridge to collapse, you know. And then that's yeah. that whole, like, fear-based thing that we're all used to hearing, especially in, like, the paranormal crypto world of, like, scaring people out of, like, being interested in it or, like, being open-minded about it. Um, but that's, yeah, that's horrifying. 46 people, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, especially oh, yeah. for that time. You know, you're thinking in the 60s. Like, that's a lot. Um, that is a lot of people. And a lot of people who, who people knew in that area, no doubt. Like, this, this would probably be people, uh, if, it, if it was people going to work, they were probably commuting to work and everything. So they were probably, some of them were lo- or locals. So there were people of that area who knew someone who died on the bridge and everything. And, yeah, I think it's that idea, like, we have to have a reason. There has to be a reason for it and everything even though when you look at it, this bridge was built in 1928 so it was probably like Overdue. needing an update <laughs> yeah 
it's a for, little over for now. how much traffic now is on compared to 1928. <laughs> right. Like vehicles became more common over time and it did it mm. probably. Oh God, that's horrible. Um, that alone though, like if we are talking about paranormal and we were talking about studying electromagnetic fields, which is literally like everything we do, what kind of energy does that create in a city like that? You know what I mean? Like you're talking about a serious massive tragedy of not only a physical concrete bridge collapsing, but now you're having massive bodies of uh, vehicles falling into the river. And th- just think yeah. about one vehicle when it falls into a river. Imagine 46 cars. There's probably not that many because there are probably two people to a car. But a massive amount of giant chunks of metal fall plunging. Into, I mean, then the people are drowning inside the cars. So think about the electromagnetic fields and energy that that's now created within this town. And, like, that's okay. definitely the loop of, like, the permanent loop that just stays with being, like, a residual haunt of just tragedy when it happens mm. like that. So that alone could honestly, it, it's sort of like the Stanley Hotel sits on um, quartz uh, crystals, you know, and it's all these mines of quartz and, and copper and everything else. And everybody says that's, like, the magnifier or the thing behind, you know, why the Stanley is so haunted and you're able to experience so much up there. This is sort of the same thing. There's so much tragedy that happened in one place. It makes you wonder if these crypto characters are attracted to high levels of electromagnetic fields. I mean, so I think it's, it's a good, it's an interesting theory. Well, that, and also you have to think too, it's like a scar on the town. It's, it's something that rippled throughout the town is a lasting scar for generations to the family members of those who were lost and everything. I mean, even though you have people in the paranormal talk about like Mothman and connect, trying to connect it to the bridge and everything, there are people in that town still that don't see it that way. They see it as a tragedy of a family member being lost to them. That was very serious. So I could just see that energy of that impact because this was would be just people going about their day and then just this happened there was no if there was any possible uh, already prediction of it possibly happening i i'm not sure if anyone ever talked about it or going hey we should check out the bridge or anything it just day to day and then this happens out of nowhere well and i'm i always think empathetically too like when you're talking about tragedy and trauma because that's such a big part of like paranormal and haunted locations how long, like literally put your, your, like, let's say your aunt was driving on that bridge in Point Pleasant and your aunt plunged into the river. We don't know how deep the river is. I'm sure we could look it up. How long does it take the city to send in emergency crews to pull those vehicles out? Probably days, probably oh, yeah. days. Between so that's, the you're right. That's even vehicles. more trauma. They're all their families are sitting there waiting for them to be pulled out of the water I mean, that's horrible. That's horrifying. You like, that's the empathy behind it is realizing the impact that it really made on the whole town. Honestly, the whole town. If I remember correctly, the river is quite deep and it's like choppy waters and it's cold because I remember being on the one side of the bridge, checking out the, the memorial and everything. And it is definitely like pretty yeah, December 15th, water. 1967 is when the bridge, cl- December 15th. That's cold. Yeah, that's cold. Like, that was probably icy oh, yeah. water. So, like, that death was pro- like, oh, that's rough. That's a rough death, mm-hmm. man. Thinking you can't get trapped. You're trapped in your car. And maybe even if you could somehow get out, now you're probably going to freeze to death trying to get out of the river. Like, that's horrifying. Um, it's, I just think it's important to talk about these things and, like, really take them apart because... I think as investigators and going to these locations, it's so easy to just be like, oh, yeah, bridge collapsed, 96, 7, all these people died. But, like, really critically think about what went into that happening. It wasn't just a couple people died. Like, cars and cars plunged into an icy river in the middle of Mm -hmm. winter. And then you probably have weird, creepy shit, like concrete from the bridge falling on top of the cars. You know what I mean? Like... You don't think of that. Oh, yeah, like, you have the debris, yeah. you have the, the wires, you have the, like you said, the concrete and steel wiring, everything coming down on, and other cars, because we don't know if, like, other cars fell on top of each exactly. other. So, it, 
I, I think I remember with the Mothman the movie, they tried to make it kind of like mysterious looking because you see like the bridge collapse and you see the cars and then you see, I think, like uh, like uh, Christmas gifts floating in the water yeah. and everything. But it's true. There People were probably shopping for Christmas. Like, seriously, mm-hmm. December 15th. Like, yeah. that's sad. That's like, like if you're getting ready to like go, you know, have family dinner with your, and this is a small town. Obviously, they're religious. You know, they're getting ready to, like, go celebrate Christmas and, like, have all these wonderful gifts in 10 days. And instead, you're planning funerals. Yep. And 49, what, 49? Is that what I said? 49 at that? that? 49, or 46, 46 people. 46. That's a lot. Think even the coroner getting involved, guys. Can you imagine a small town? They would have multiple places to get involved if they were taking care of that. I mean, that's what's so crazy is, like, can you imagine the city, the coroners, the morgues, funeral homes trying to figure out how to (laughs) bury 46 people. Holy shit. Yeah. That's sad. That's crazy. Like, especially for that time. So, um, okay. Moving forward to, go ahead. I want to say, uh, I can't remember how many, I want to say there were a couple people who were never identified because you have to remember too, these people would have to be identified too. And everything. That's true. And I want to say some of them, not many. I want to say only a few of them were actually never fully, never identified. Wow. wow, 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 wow. You don't think about that stuff. Um, I think we had a question because Kat pointed out: Could Mothman be an interdimensional being? Oh, I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. Especially the the kind of the sporadicness, maybe of him, like. It's not like people go hunting, like, where where would Mothman nest and everything? So I can <laughs> see the possibility. When you that. say nest, I've heard people say that. And I think of him, like, laying eggs in a it's nest. A like, giant <laughs> nest on the top of a pot or something. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, it is. Well, that's the next question. No. Like, is there only one Mothman? Is there multiple Mothman? I mean, is there like, a like, Mrs. Mothman? The lock nest. Is there a moth woman? Maybe you guys have it mixed up. Maybe it's not and a man. Small moth babies. Hashtag <laughs> feminism. Okay, like maybe it's a she. Okay, no, it, mm-hmm. it does. You, you you don't know, but um, it's kind of like oh man, um, mm-hmm. chupacabra. Yeah, where like all of a sudden you have chupacabra um, getting involved, and like you have all these um, you know pictures or like people saying they see him in Puerto Rico and then all of a sudden Puerto, uh, Trooper Cobra's in uh, Florida and then I think he's been spotted in like Mexico and then like there's certain Tomorrow. areas but then all of a sudden like nothing and then all of a sudden he's back in Puerto Rico so it does make you wonder like same with Mothman you go like forever not hearing of any sightings of him like the most recent major sighting I would say was probably 9-11 do you think Actually, there was more recent sighting in 20... Well, it's one of those, like, it's... I don't know if it's completely verified, but there's a... 2016, there was a photo... 2016, there was a photo, and 2017, there's supposedly sightings of it. So that's that's the most recent one. But it's, like, kind of spaced out. I don't think there was anything before 2016, and like, after the 9-11. Mm-hmm. Um... It does mean interdimensional could be come it comes in and out comes in and out you don't know you know it's sort of like uh the bermuda triangle and like the alaskan triangle of like where all these like ships disappear to and where all these planes disappear to and like there's more people that disappear in the alaskan triangle than the bermuda triangle so it does make you wonder there's portals going on is there are things interdimensional <laughs> you have like also you have all these reports of like the ufos and the, the ghost lights and everything. So you have all these things that also match up with usually, like you said, Bermuda Triangle or Lassa Triangle and like kind of these dimensional things that just kind of pop in and out in this like general area outside of Point Pleasant, but near it and everything. Mm-hmm. So I could see it connected with that and everything. I mean, John Kill definitely went into definitely the, the, the UFO angle of it and whatnot. I have two questions. One person said, a client said, I loved all of my previous videos. I don't know. I don't think there's any missing. I know that a couple of weeks ago I had a podcast I had to delete because I was getting comments saying that the audio was bad on it and I still haven't updated that. 
But other than that, I think everything should be up live. Um, someone else said, do you ever go on investigations? Yes, I can't talk about what we're doing in the future because we're um, doing it in private. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> what we did recently, we won four film festivals um, with our last Ooh. investigation. Yep. And um, it was really awesome. We went to a haunted location in um, Arizona. And so, yeah, yes, we do go on investigations. But we like to talk about, about this about small stuff. towns. <laughs> yeah, that was... I don't want to go back there, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's, it's honestly, the small towns in the middle of nowhere places get some of the best mm-hmm. evidence and the best, like, folklore and legends. And it's just, like, you kind of have to adapt to it. But, yeah, unfortunately, you end up, most of the time, they're not in the middle of nowhere but you get the best stuff <laughs> it's true and i but there is a lot of haunts out there there's a lot more to be found and be seen and like for me i get sick of seeing the same big locations over and over again yeah and, you know and i don't get me wrong i'd love to go to those too you know like but i oh, think yeah. that you don't need to go to all gigantic locations because it's just too much with small locations you're right people haven't seen them people haven't seen these um the towns are literally on fire with energy and you're right. Sometimes you can get better investigations and evidence out of small locations than you can. Some of the ones that have been overdone so much. Oh yeah. I, I would love to honestly discover a couple places that have not already been on like a tour guide or in like 10,000 books. Like I don't mind. I love finding the local legends, like the ones that you usually find in the self published, uh, local author stuff, like, and, like those hidden nuggets of locations that haven't yet been really hit, that haven't been over investigated. Like I said, those are always fascinating because then there's, it's a lot more fresh, uh, raw information that you can really go through instead of having all the layers of now, like, well, someone saw this and someone saw this and someone mm-hmm. saw this on these investigations. Now you have to sift through that to find the real stuff. <laughs> It's true, but I also think that when, you, when you're talking about, like, crews of people, like, mm-hmm. if Kat, Elfie, and I go somewhere to investigate, and if, even if it's, like, like, the Stanley Hotel has been overdone a thousand times, we would still come out with different evidence than other people have. Because oh, yeah. it's all about your energy and what, like, energy you're muting with when you're in that location. So that's mm-hmm. the good part about these different locations is you – there's so many opportunities depending on like, I've even known friends that go ghost hunting with different groups of people, different times, and they'll go to the same place, different groups, and they come out with just totally different stuff. And it's just cause oh, yeah. your energy interacting, especially us with three girls going in, who knows what would happen with some of these locations. It'd be very different than what we've always seen on TV over and over so many times. Yeah. Oh yeah. And also like I, this is one of the things I enjoy doing too, is the idea of I don't mind having surface level information about a place, but I kind of like going in there without too much info to front load. And then maybe afterwards doing the research, because I feel like when you front load yourself, then it's like, you're not sure, am I experiencing this because it's actually happening or because I'm expecting it because everyone else has told me you experience this. <laughs> That's what happened with the pilot. We were prepared because it was native ground as indigenous culture. And we actually didn't really get any indigenous um, EVPs or anything like that. It was all miners and coal workers. But it was good to have that information because we were still able to communicate. We wanted to make sure they knew we had our story right. But you're right. We came out with totally different evidence that we weren't even prepared to have. So, But that's yeah, what I, Elfie does yeah. for our future locations. Elfie's <laughs> always doing our history for all, all of our locations. And then she does our, like, creepy occult stuff. So I always want to, and that's what you guys love, too. You guys are always like, oh, my God, Elfie was the occult specialist. She was always doing weird, creepy witch shit on Paranormal State. And that's her job again, except this time she's not doing it alone. Kat and I are doing it with her. So we always want to incorporate something creepy occult involved, like, to start it, maybe a seance or something like that at each location. So that's what we're excited for. Like, shaking it up and trying something different because, like, it's one of those, like, there's, there's been so many methods done that it's the same old. It's like, let's try something different. Let's try something new now and everything and just see what happens. Not like go like, well, we're expecting Aunt May is going to show up. It's like, no, let's just see what actually pops, pops up. Actually, it's usually demons. It's always a demon. Yeah, demon. It's always a demon. It's always a demon, damn. <laughs> 
I actually, I was watching this TikTok last night. This FYP girl came up on my page. It was kind of interesting. I, I, it's a good opportunity to chat about it. She was just saying that um, she's like, you know, a lot of people have, have she said demonized demons, which I laughed about because it's kind of true. Because she was like, you know, you demonize demons because we read in the Bible that demons are bad and they come up from hell and da 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 da. And she mm-hmm. was, she's a psychic and she um, experiences like outer worldly beings and whatever. She goes, but what if it's not? like bad she goes like she goes you have to think of demons as like their own class like like humans like aliens like there's different types of aliens like mothman and then uh, you know uh chupacabra like they're your your own class sort of thing so she goes within demons it's like humans there's some good humans and then there's bad humans and then with demons there's bad demons and there's not so bad demons but unfortunately we've been trained in our brain from society from religion from bibles from the damn paranormal shows that we watch that demons are always going to inhabit your body and cause you to throw up green pea soup every time right and so you have fear automatically and it's true because like I've been around demonic stuff I know Elfie's been around demonic stuff and I laugh watching these shows because like yes I've been around some dark bad stuff but then some other stuff you know it's dark but like it doesn't bother you it's not like what they portrayed on tv no, and it's and it's to me too is we in the parallel field. Unfortunately, when we think of demons and stuff, it's it's a very Christianized version of demons. When it's like many different cultures have their idea of either dark entities or or demons are called different things, and they're not simply evil or bad or something like that. It's just that's just like one very small slice of one particular religion's view and everything because that's all you see and everything Mm -hmm. and to me it's like one of those where we we shade it into that because that's all we hear about we think when actually it's it's one of those i think there's we try to put a human um morals on something that isn't human and even though it doesn't fall by our morals doesn't necessarily mean it's bad it's just it doesn't fall by our rules Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to fall by our rules and everything and that's where we have to figure out well what does it actually want or what's it expecting because Mm -hmm. if we try to fit it into the into the round peg it's it's not going to ever work it's true and also we we kind of front load ourselves with this idea of like if we think if we encounter anything that is even slightly miffed with us we're like oh my god it's evil it's like no <laughs> you probably just pissed it off because you're in its house and you're moving stuff around and they probably didn't want you to do that so of course you'd be pissed too if someone's moving your stuff around and everything yeah. What did you expect? <laughs> yeah. Erica, hey girl, hey, what are you doing? I, I think, it, are you, am I, find me on Instagram. Why am I not, I haven't heard from you. Anyway, um, yes, I agree. Yeah. It just, so uh, it's, and it gets under my skin. It gets under my skin. It's I'm just a very like, West, oh. Western view. It's very Western view of it when it's like, it's, it's not that simple, honestly. Yeah, I know. It's, well, it's all deeper, but that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, which is, you're perfect. Is it? moth man is it moth woman is it a family is it more is it way more than just like you know when i think of family it's like moth man moth woman his wife and there are three moth babies what if it's like 20 and they're not related like like why don't why don't why are we so specific on one you know what i mean like i love critical thinking and opening your mind up to it it's the same thing like with demonic stuff it's like god i get blah, you know like the sightings are like driving on the dirt road in the middle of nowhere and they see this thing they probably could have been driving through its territory and it was like hey get out get out of my area this sure. is my area or something uh-huh. or hell it could have been hunting mm-hmm. and you just interrupted like, it yeah basically mm-hmm. <laughs> and luckily it didn't become lunch but and you it's probably hungry. just interrupted right it's hunting season i agree i agree um we have another where can we watch the arizona investigation um, I don't, it's not available for purchase right now. I had had it on, um, YouTube for, um, the high, high tier subscribers, but, um, we took it down for reasons that what our future is, is doing right now. Um, I, we can't talk about it. Okay. 
don't pressure me because I just can't say any more than that. <laughs> so, oh my God. Erica is my friend. She's uh, an attorney. So she's like, um, I'll be Crystal's attorney. And um, <laughs> shut up, Crystal. Don't say anything. No. Um, so uh, Mothman prophecies. There's books. There's, I mean, it's just crazy. I would, oh, yeah. I would love to go do the Mothman thing for sure. But you're right. That's See, that's the problem with these investigations going back to the outdoor gig. Because I want you guys to really think before you do this stuff. You need be to really fair. plan ahead. <laughs> like, really plan yeah. ahead. You can't just be like, oh, I'm three hours from Point Pleasant. Let's just hop in the car and go. That's not, you know, it, the time of, like, is it winter? You know, like Elfie said, she was freezing and yet she was bundled up. And oh. then... But then you get so bundled, then you, you're moving, and then you get hot, and then if you take your jacket off, you're cold again. Like, you have to really think. Like Your clothes are making noises. I've seen moving around, and that just drives <laughs> everyone up the wall. <laughs> your audio text like, I hate you, Elfie. Stop moving. You're like, sorry. Like, well, especially if we wear a leather jacket, because I think I was wearing a leather jacket to keep warm. And it's like, great, 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 great. I'm mm-hmm. like, I can't, I can't not make noise with this thing. <laughs> I'm also not going to freeze. That happened to me when I was filming Paranormal, uh, Paranormal Challenge. I we were uh, I hate. There's a shot of me on on that episode where my hair is like sticking up. People don't understand. I was in a building in the middle of July with no air conditioning in Arizona, and it was oh the, it was like 135 degrees in the building. And I was like, why are we filming in here? It's so hot. And they were like, you have to wear your jacket. And I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna die. And like we were in this like upper floor of this like deteriorating it was just unsafe shouldn't have been in their building but it looked cool for film and we're standing on this like rubble you know and i'm i'm (laughs) I'm, we're doing b-roll shots so most of the time for b-roll you have to stand still for like an extended period of time you know what i mean and i'm standing on rubble and like you're like you move in half an inch not even and you're like you know like everything shifts and then they like yell at you you're moving for b-roll and you're like it's so hot in here and my feet hurt from standing on gravel for the last hour and so you do you have to think of it's so much more than just getting in the car and going to investigate you have to plan the time of year you're doing it, what you're wearing, wearing layers. Like Elfie said, if there's an emergency, do you have a compass? Like, are you prepared? Um, like I said, what if you get lost by accident? I, 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 if I remember correctly, like, um, like reception was not very good out there, if I remember correctly. I bet. So it's one of those, like, I bet. if you have a cell phone, probably don't expect to get reception out there yeah i've been like a lot of the small towns i filmed at like oh yeah i don't even think people will have smartphones in some of those small towns honestly so (laughs) it's true it's true i remember i went i had an iphone for for this one shoot and it was like i was like where is the cell phone service there's none they're like yeah Mm -hmm. nobody really worries about cell phone service we still have like home telephones and i'm like (gasps) We have this thing called a landline. We still have the. <laughs> am I in the twilight zone? Where am I? I don't know what to do. It doesn't matter where you go. You have no service on your phone. Like, legit. Like, none. So, no. Also, go ahead. Well, yeah. And also, I would say, too, if you're going to small towns and you're going to outweigh towns, too, I would say, like, understand, like, even if there's, like, uh, stories or, or legends doesn't mean the people there are just going to suddenly open up and talk to you. Because if you're someone who's not local, they're like, who are you? What do you want? Like, you almost kind of have to get them to warm up to you before you get them talking. Now, of course, there will be some people local there. They'll, like, talk your ear off and everything. But you also have to kind of respect the fact that you're not local there. Why do they need to talk? To, why would they want to talk to you? So it's like you have to kind of like feel it out because not everyone also digs the idea of like, oh, yeah, our, house, our our place is haunted or, yeah, this this happened here or this tragedy happened here. Not everyone wants to talk about that. So that's it's one a, of those you have to kind of be that's a good delicate. <laughs> that's a really good point to bring up, too. Mm-hmm. I am. Um, S.A. Rosen just said, hey, Crystal, hope you're well. Hey, boo. I, XOXO. I love you guys. Um, I was uh, filming in for this pilot I was talking about in Arizona and we had to take our um, security Josh with us. Josh went with us and um, we were filming in the small town first. And then we had to go like there's main street, which 
Elsie, there was 10 stores on Main Street. You know what I mean? Like, this is Main Street. Uh-huh. And literally, been- to get groceries, you had to drive 45 minutes out of town. So, like, but we, so it we filmed, up oh, yeah, it was, like, weird. You know what I mean? Like, whoa. Who, and the, by the way, if there was an emergency in town, they do not have fire department or a, uh, what was it called, uh, ambulance. So, like, if you call oh, 911, cool. yeah, if you call 911, you're fucked. Like, like you can, there's nothing you can do. Like, you better get in your pickup truck and drive yourself 45 minutes to the hospital, like, literally. But so we were filming, and we were, like, in town, in the downtown area, and we were unpacking film gear. And I I told our my, Josh, the security, I was like, dude, just chill and, like, sway. If, if anybody comes around us, just do the talk for me. You know what I mean? So we're, we're getting all this equipment like, out, and then all of a sudden here moseys in some people, and they're mm-hmm. like, "What are you doing, Dark Town?" And we're like, "What are you doing?" You know, because it is small. <laughs> You're talking ten businesses, yeah. and like, and Josh looks at me, and I was like, "Just talk to us." You know, like, and so Josh was like, yeah, yeah, we're filming a documentary here. And he did, he schmoozed them. He <laughs> schmoozed them. But it's interesting because, which is why he's so necessary for, for us when we're on the road. You know what I mean? But like, um, cause we're like busy getting equipment out and Josh was like, oh yeah, let me tell you what's going on. But it, it's, some people will not be receptive to you. So like, if I would have walked up to him, he would not have been receptive to me. So you're right. You have to be very aware of your surroundings because people will, will either love you or hate you because that's their territory and they don't oh, yeah. want you to do their town wrong and they don't want you to mess something up or, or, you know, like it's, a, it's very much that like you're the outsider sort of vibe. Well, especially if the location already has like a reputation or history of like this thing happening in like other documentaries or shows have already spin it. So they already are aware of it. It's one of those like you have to sh- when I've talked to people and everything, when we're trying to interview and, and try to get the story out, usually it's like you don't like get come right out the gate of like, so we heard some people died here and this happened and this crash happened. Like you don't go out the gate with that. You kind of like first almost like show that, hey, I know you're a person. I kind of care about you and like I want to know the story, but I understand and just kind of work up to that and they'll finally actually start chatting with you. But like, don't go out the gate with like, hey, let's just hit it over the head. <laughs> it's true. It, it's uh, social cues. Is that a good way mm-hmm. of putting it? Social cues, um, thinking ahead, and oh, yeah. really being aware of uh, communication is really important. Oh, yeah. Because you're all like, you know, you take Elfie, Cat and I, these like three gothic looking witch chicks in a town. People are like, who? Do these girls think that they are coming, you know, like, and they are standoffish us. So we need other people that can step in. And, you know, sometimes you go into misogynist areas that don't want to communicate with you as a female. And that's kind of what happened in Arizona too. And luckily that's when Josh stepped in. Thank God he was there. And he was like, and then the guy was like, at first he was really like, Oh, I don't like this, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. and then he was like, Oh, this is kind of cool. What you guys are doing. You know what I mean? So it is, you yeah. have to be smart. You have to think it's critical thinking and communication and knowing how to handle people because you do want to respect the land. You do want to respect if it's Mothman or not. Like you, you want to respect the people, the community, and especially something like Mothman, although it's in a town of only 4,000, like we talked about in the beginning, that is literally their economy. You need to respect them. Like they need that for their economy to like, or the freaking place will fall off the map. Like, literally. You know what I mean? If you talk to someone and you piss them off, or you rub them the wrong way where they, they this this left a bad taste, uh, everyone's going to find out real fast. <laughs> and then the people you try to talk to later on, they're, they'll probably already know way ahead. And they're like, yeah, no, I don't want to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Because the person you just pissed off probably told everyone else. Mm-hmm. Of like, well, like hey, said, don't had, talk to these people. They're I had just, the police like, call, call on us. Trouble. Yeah, we mm-hmm. were in this town. And I'm talking like they still drove like really old school police cars to where the city oh, no. And So then you're like, because as a filmmaker too, you're like thinking mm-hmm. like, this looks very like, uh, you know, wild, wild west, like dirt road yeah with this like, old... it's just a little sketchy yeah, yeah like you're in a time warp you know what i mean but like and what had happened was i had another camera this is like years ago i had another camera tech on set and he had gone to town alone because it's very small and this is the one that where 900 people i think lived 
So you could literally walk everywhere. So he walked to town to like go get drink or something and probably wasn't friendly, but is an outsider. And then people, you're right. It spreads like a wildfire. And then we're downtown Fire. filming and we have all these cameras and, you know, lighting, like Elfie said, you look, you stand out. Like there's no way you can't stand out. And then here comes the police and they're like, what are you doing here? And then of course somebody has to be the one to communicate. I try to make it myself usually, and usually mm-hmm. it works. But like I said, sometimes you do get into small towns where there's misogynistic issues and they don't want to talk to the female, period. Mm-hmm. And so you have to make oh, sure you have a backup. Get, like, and such. Sometimes. Get signed off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes you do. Yeah, for sure. You have to make sure that you're doing it right. And, mm-hmm. and people, they, you know, they're very just protective of their town. They don't want... I, it, I think it's that, like, M. Night Shyamalan, the village type of vibes. You know what I mean? Where it's like, you're, we're safe here and we don't want outsiders. And then if an outsider comes in, we're unsafe. So now we have to watch you. So you, you do. You have to respect it. You have to respect it for sure. Well, and what I always found, like, because I would usually go to, like, the historical societies or local library where I would find local... The local history and everything. Mm-hmm. How many times can I say local? Uh, um, Elfie just loves books. Okay, it's all about libraries and books. <laughs> like that's libraries. And the thing is, is like most of the time, those are run by retired people or, or older people who know the area. Like if you talk to them, they will tell you all sorts of stuff. But you have to really approach it where you have a genuine interest in their town like you really actually want it's not like i'm trying to get some sound bites from you it's more like i really do want to know about this area and it might take a while but eventually like they'll tell you the information you want to hear but you have to really like talk to them like a human being and they'll also sometimes will give you like the papers and the research that you need just because you were courteous to them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's true well and sometimes that stuff isn't accessible unless you talk to somebody you know that because that's your thing that's your gig and so sometimes they're like no i don't know what you're talking about yep oh yeah Uh, yeah Yeah, they don't want to talk to them yeah (laughs) that's a good point some and that happened in antonito colorado sometimes it's such a small town they don't want people to know the trauma and tragedy that happened and in antonito that one was i think 700 people lived there so it was very small but it um literally guys i shit you not um there was some massive like uh, gangster activity going in this town and like sketchy shit you know what i mean like where the government was involved with like uh paying people off what's new but um they they went so far to the extent where the the government officials burned down the library and all the wow. paperwork and books in it and so when we were there, I had already gotten, like, the, the facts or whatever, you know, from, like, general research. But I wanted to see what else they had. And I go into the librarian, and she's like, I wish I could give it to you, honey. But she goes, it's it's ash at the bottom of the mountain. And so it, it is weird. You're right. You don't know what to yeah. expect sometimes. You go into these places, and you do have to be prepared for it. It's strange. Oh, yeah. Strange. Because not everything's digitalized and on, online. Most of the time, those kind of towns are not at all, honestly. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Oh, yeah. So, well, I mean... Oh, go ahead. They're tiny. They're small. They're underfunded. Yep. Also, if you if you can, if you do go to a small town, do research and do investigation, what actually really helps, too, I know, is to, like, if you make a donation, whoop, make a donation to... The historical society, the library, it really just, they really appreciate it because most of the time they are way underfunded. And that's why most of their stuff is not even digitalized because they can't afford it. Mm-hmm. It's true. Just in courtesy or like what I did with the uh, pilot, I mm-hmm. went to the tribe that we had worked with. And then I went to, I think it was also the historical society in the area. And I said, please let me give you credits in the film. And I want them to have, I want you to have the credits because it is your footage, it's your pictures, it's your photographs. And then maybe from my pilot that can get, uh, help get some tourist stuff coming, you know, going up part of this. And then they're like, oh my God, that would be amazing. (laughs) But you, you want to give them credit where credit's due because you're right. Mm -hmm. Like they are the ones that are, are holding this important information and stuff. So yeah. But you're right, there's a way to do it, and that's why I'm really happy we have Elfie on to, to help you guys, because 
you know, the reason the paranormal field is not saturated with good uh, paranormal film is because people don't know what they're doing. And most of the time, the production companies are throwing things together extremely fast and they don't know paranormal. They only know film and they don't do it right. And that's why they only last one or two seasons because you, there is a right way and a wrong way. And it is muting the actual paranormal side and history is so vital, so vital, but you have to mute it with the film side. And that's where it's so rare. And that's why there's not a lot of good paranormal TV. That's exactly why. And Elfie's like, and I'm a librarian. Okay. <laughs> I'm the like, supreme this, this librarian. I had to learn along the way. Like this was definitely a learning curve to it. So it's like, you, you learn it as you go, but that's why I'm like telling you now, like do this. You'll be so much better for it. Yeah. You'll be, ha- you have to talk to somebody, you have to talk to somebody. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, you put in notes, um, theories, <laughs> find what, all, what Mothman is. Could he be a crane? Could he be an owl? <laughs> Could he be a goose? A thunderbird? <laughs> um, or is, or a banshee? I thought that was a cool theory, actually. Like a banshee, but like maybe like a crypto banshee? Like that's kind of a cool theory. Yeah, the, the basically, it was the idea. Was, it, similar to the banshee folklore, the foreteller, foreteller of like disasters or danger or death and whatnot. So that was the idea that why everyone thought that with the photo of everything around the bridge, like was Mothman warning people that something was going to happen and everything. See, and that's why I, and we'll, we'll get to that too. I want to talk, see if you think he's helping or hindering, you know what I mean? But with Mothman, you just have to kind of, for me being indigenous you're talking about a like larger than human humanoid or whatever you want to call it um with like a giant wingspan and he's like six foot seven feet tall whatever when i think of wings or feathers which just keeps coming up over and over is indigenous to me my brain that's just my brain and that's because my indigenous family um, believes in animal totems spirit totems and usually like the biggest totems you can see are like hawks or crows or things that are flying. That's usually like a very protective energy. Owls are included. Like if it's a, it's a, everyone has spirit totems, um, in, in my, um, heritage of indigenous and, um, you have to connect with those through your like spirit guides or meditation, whatever. Mine is a hawk. Mine's absolutely a hawk. Um, that's a lineage thing from my family. And, um, the spirit totems though, the, you're uh, compared to like the skinwalker. Okay. The skinwalker is, to most people on the outside, the skinwalker is like, oh, you know, is it an animal morphing from, you know, like a, like a coyote or a cougar into this like cryptoid creature um, that's like doing harm. But, or some theories like, we don't know what it is. You know what I mean? Now on the indigenous side of a skinwalker, it's usually a previous like druid and or um, shaman, depending on the tribe, that has basically turned uh, what they would call a dark witch and turn to like the dark magics. And because they turn to the dark magics, they now can, uh, morph into this like creature or being. And that's why they're roaming, killing creatures, killing people, luring them into the forest, whatever. Now comparing that to the Mothman seems most, most legit to me, but it, to me, it would be like skinwalker, bad Mothman, either chaotic, neutral, or like good like of warning. And I'm just yeah. thinking that because indigenous feathers flying is very like animal totemy to me, like 100%. Um, oh, yeah. so now going around to that, would you think Mothman is bad or neutral or good? Put probably Mothman more into the neutral state because I don't think as far as I at least can see with research stuff that it was ever really, we, like, because of the photo and such, and because of some reports, people jump to the conclusion, like, there has to be a connection because of disaster. But I think that's, that's more people assuming. I don't think it, it, I mean, it's not like it was flying around and, like, gnawing on the bridge to, to make it fall or anything. 
So I feel <laughs> like it was. Is that what a theory is? Is that he was like he shook? The I don't. Bridge? That's the th- that's the only thing. It's like, that's why I try to figure out that's because ridiculous, they're like, oh, but I think it's dropped right. the bridge. It's oh. like, what was it like? Wh- how? Because like what? It just sat on the bridge, like a right. cartoon, like sat on the bridge and it just collapsed. <laughs> like I don't. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I feel like it's a more of a like, neutral being, right? And that it might have like coincidentally be around there. It could have been drawn to w- what was going to happen, but it doesn't mean it like it was a watcher being drawn to the area, but not necessarily causing it. Just no, but I do think warning warning is, going to be. is accurate. Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, like if it was flying around I could the bridge, see possible warning. Yeah. Same with nine eleven, like it, warning, like. Mm-hmm. Like, tragedy's about to strike or, or tra- you know, there's going to be something traumatic happen. Like, I can see warning. I agree. Mm-hmm. Neutral for sure. Not, at, But, you know, same thing, though. Sorry, my dogs are barking. Um, I don't know why. Who knows? They're, they're ankle biters. It's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're little. They're all, like, five pounds. Uh, oh, speaking of that, Theo, uh, my, my baby puppy, he's not a puppy. He's two now. He was um, chosen to, um, or being, he's being nominated to be part of the NSPCA's um, calendar for um, to oh. help adopted animals. So um, I have the link on my Twitter. So if you guys would go vote for him, I would appreciate it. And all of the money that's raised for this will go for um, helping shelter animals get adopted. But I was really excited awesome. that, that Theo got nominated. And I, I wrote his blurb, so please make sure you go read it because it will <laughs> probably make you laugh. But um, sorry, going back to that, um, the shamanistic thing of, you know, if you're talking about indigenous, like, I'm not saying it is indefinitely indigenous. I'm saying, like, even if it's interdimensional or outerworldly, to me, just being um, that it's, like, a protector of the land, like Elfie and I talked about, like, that, to me, feels very, like, culturally indigenous. And to me, it's, like, um, you're right, protector of the land and of the people, warnings. But once again, it's an outsider. It's unfamiliar to us as a society what do we do with things that are unfamiliar to us? We, de- we demonize it, literally. And it's a demon and it's dark and it's going to kill everybody and it's going to eat you. Now, there was, there is one thing, though, that I was reading through your notes. Supposedly, it did eat a dog. That was very, like, random when I was researching it because I'm like, wait, did someone see it literally? Because I've heard of cryptos of um, large bird cryptos that have picked up small animals even picked up children and stuff, reported doing that, and people, like, grabbed the kitten before it flew off. But it seemed very grand with <laughs> the mock sorry, man. that's just, like, that image in my head of, like, oh, shit, the bird man's got my son. I've got to go grab it but, real quick. You know what I mean? You're, like, running no, out there. there were reports, like, these, like, large, like, thunderbirds or large birds, and people report seeing this huge bird and swoop down and grab their kid, and they had to, like, grabbed the kid by the ankles and quickly like yanked the kid down before the bird was able to fly off. I'm like, what bird is big enough to pick up even <laughs> a small child? Oh my god. So, that was a random, but yeah, the, the, the dog was a very random thing because I'm like, and during my research, I'm like, I don't remember it ever, I never remember it, hearing about it eating anything, so when I saw the dog report, I'm like, that seems so random, like it ate a dog. And it was a and German like, shepherd. When and this yeah, wouldn't there be more reports of other yeah. animals going missing? I agree. If that was its, like... 1967 like, is when this supposedly happened. But remember, this is, yeah. like, the height of Mothman. It was, like, 66, 67. And then all of a sudden, there was, like, 100 people that came out saying, I also saw Mothman. So, to me, it's just, like, once again, trying to instill the fear in people of, like, it ain't my dog. Like, what? Like, I, I feel like maybe wildlife might have gone to, like, there was might be coyotes. Sure. Or just some wildlife creature or your dog got out and and harmed unfortunately but it's like did you see a moth and like literally like pick up the pup and take it off <laughs> no it's true just, where, where i guess it was a very random note i'm like i'm just going to put this in here because this is like i don't remember ever hearing the mothman oh yes it eats the local pets the german like, shepherds of what? all things <laughs> Okay, it's a big dog. Like, that's a big dog. Yeah, yeah it's not even, like, the tiny dogs or, like... <laughs> Elfie's like, it should be... A, it's a chihuahua, okay? It prefers chihuahuas. <laughs> oh, my God. And also, the German Shepherd, like, they... they I would think a German Shepherd would put up a fight, too. It's not, like... It's, it's a German Shepherd. They're big. 
Oh, okay, somebody asked a question for you about paranormal state, and I'm not going to ask. Okay, Elfie um, does not answer questions regarding paranormal state unless it was her personal experience, like, on set. So, like, we made that rule. I actually made that rule for her. Sorry, Elfie. Um, because she just doesn't want to be caught in uncomfortable circumstances, and she still has peace with everybody. So if you want to ask a, a specific question about like a location that she's investigated and what she experienced specifically at that location, you can ask that, but I won't ask her other questions, if that makes sense. And that's just out of respect of our supreme being here. Um, <laughs> so um, now there have been some modern sightings. Chicago, mm -hmm. there's been 55 sightings of Mothman during 2017. Holy shit. Yeah, like Jesus. that one I found unusual. There's like everyone was apparently seeing him all over the place, and this was interesting because it was also one that even the person reporting was like kind of questioning, like, "Were you really seeing the Mothman? I mean, are you sure mm -hmm. you saw it? Like, was there an anniversary going on here?" Or something? Now the next one, though, I believe, which is Hunters in 2016, mm -hmm. that were in West Virginia, think that they encountered the Mothman or something similar to it. And they basically were driving on the highway when they saw something jump out from, like, a tree. Um, they pulled over to take photos, but they couldn't get anything on camera. Now, that, I believe, could have happened for sure. Yeah, and I saw the footage of that because, like, apparently they were driving down, down the highway and everything. And they saw something jumping from tree to tree. And they pulled over and were taking photos. And, it, I mean, when you look at the photo, it looks... This is where it's one of those, like, it's Oh, there is a photo. There is a photo of this. Yeah, there is a photo of it. If you go link and everything, where... It's kind of questionable of, yeah, like, um, oh, uh, okay, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. because it looks so classic, it could be a bird, too, I mean, yeah, like, yeah, well, it, it's it looks almost distance. too classically Mothman, if it's, yeah. like, super, like, if the bird is super close, that could just be a damn bird, now, if that's, like, a, mm -hmm. if it's, yeah, I mean, it, eh, you're right, meh, meh, you don't know, yeah. And this problem is, too, when you look at a photo, you can't really tell what the size is. There's no way to... It looks like it has, like, hook game. claws that are, like, kind of like this, if, if that's the case. Honestly, it could be an owl, because, like, if you ever see, like, barn owls and everything, people think of the little squat, but actually, if they, like, their legs get pretty stretched out long when they, like, jump and everything. So it could, honestly, be just a large, like, barn owl or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Because, I... like I said, you don't... You can't really tell what size it is. Yeah. You just see something in the air. I mean, they caught something for sure. I'm not. I'm not saying. Oh yeah. It, but you just can't say it infinitely. Mm -hmm. So there's been tons of movies, obviously, done on this. We know this. And mm -hmm. now this chief stuff. Do you want to talk about this? Because I found it kind of interesting. This is the one. Like I do remember research a bit about it. There is also uh, similar to the Mothman statue. There is another statue made of a uh, same deal or something by the same artist i believe mm -hmm. over by uh the the river near the silver where the silver bridge was mm -hmm. where now i think it's the new memorial <laughs> silver bridge or something mm -hmm. uh there is a statue dedicated to who they call chief cornstalk mm -hmm. and his his actual name in um shawnee i believe was pronounced kitoga mm -hmm. kitoga i'm probably butchering that totally but um everyone in this at least in the story has known him as chief cornstalk and everything that's so, very indigenous to be named after um animals or the land that's very indigenous mm -hmm. yeah and apparently he was very active just before and during the american revolution uh because there were also wars and skirmishes going on uh during that time as colonists were starting to move west because you have to think too that at that time what is west virginia now was still very much woods and wilderness and still um uncolonized area and unfortunately like isolated the colonies for were sure. slowly making their way mm -hmm. across the west and there were wars and skirmishes um breaking out between that and also the revolution war too and he was definitely in the thick of it, from what it sounds like. Uh, let's see here. So, there's proof he actually did exist because he's in historical documents yes. of 1764. So, Chief Cornstalk was real. It's a person. So yeah, he is. He is a real person. And everything. He was apparently a part of the Battle of Point Pleasant, or known as the Battle of Ka Kanawha, 
Um, he is the, it was fought in October 1774 between the Virginia Mounte, the Shawnee, and the Mingo Warriors. Um, apparently, at some point during this time, too, he started to try to actually work with the, the British Americans, with the Americans at, at that point, to create some sort of peace or try to find a neutral stance and everything. Because he was involved with the wars and the battles and skirmishes, but then at some point he started trying to work to be to to try to find some sort of neutral ground to help with his people with the Shawnee and everything, so that probably because he saw so many dying and so much death and everything, Tragedy. he just didn't want that anymore. Yeah. But unfortunately, he was captured along with some others, and uh, let's see. They a diplomatic visit Fort Randolph in Virginia, West Virginia, hoping uh, to learn American tensions. He and three others were imprisoned by Fort Commander when American military men was killed by natives in the Fort vicinity. Angry soldiers executed Corsa, which apparently he was shot eight times in the place he was captured. Like, they basically, a uh, man was killed, they blamed uh, his people, and they, 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 felt that he had something to do with it so out of anger they're like they went in they and they executed him and a couple others and it was just one of those like it sounded almost like just a rage moment of like no discussion just this happened um he mur he was murdered and uh, local legends claim that he laid a curse on the area as he died and that the disaster of 1967 with the Silver Bridge in, and Mothman sightings were connected to him. Which, that's, to me, the odd part. Mm -hmm. because Just randomly pulling Mothman. Like, but that, but also, interesting. Like 70, 70, 70, 1967, mm -hmm. that's when he decided, like, that's when the curse decided to, to act. Right. Like, that Why did it when? take it? Um, hundred years for the curse to be enacted right and that's the thing that i don't think people understand either with indigenous like curses because like honest to god with indigenous land being everywhere everywhere could be cursed literally but a curse doesn't i mean it could take place as someone's dying but what it really is is when an indigenous tribe has land somewhere you know they've built up the land and they love the land and they care for the land and the land is also like a breathing entity you know what I mean and like to the point where like it's it's a physical self so if you come in on that land even after you execute an entire tribe you it's almost like the land itself is alive cursing you if that makes sense it's not necessarily they're chanting and like if anyone steps on this land they die it's not necessarily that same with um What's that lake, that haunted lake where the, the native Indian princess died in is on the East Coast? can't remember. Lake Shawnee, I think that's it. Um, okay, I think that, yeah. yeah but sh same thing. Like, people like, oh, everybody drowns because, like, you know, the lake, it, she cursed everybody because she couldn't be with her lover. No, once again, the lake was an entity to them. That's an in And it's still alive. Just because the tribe was pushed out or killed doesn't mean the lake leaves. The lake is still an entity. I don't think people realize how much in, of indigenous culture, like anything on this planet that, that breathes and eats, sleeps, including a plant, down to like a shrub, down to the sage you use to burn your house, is an entity to the indigenous. And they serve it and they, it's sacred. It's literally sacred. So in other words, it's not necessarily uh, the, the Shawnee that put the curse it's the lake because the lake's pissed that you've now disrespected not only its people, but the lake itself, if that makes sense. Because people just don't realize. So, yeah, and also a lot of times these places are usually, they, they've they been recognized as something, there was something about them. There was something sacred about them. There was some energy about them. And the people, the indigenous people before recognized that, respected that sometimes interacted with it and even if they are gone doesn't mean that place is any less it's mm -hmm. still there and we still see it today that there's places that even they've been built up 
that were once possibly sacred places, there's still a feel about them. Mm-hmm. It, it never changes, even if there's stuff built on it, even if the people originally who did respect it were taken out of it. It's still there. It is still just as active as it was before and everything. It never changes. That's true. 100%. Even if the tribe's removed. Mm-hmm. It's the same It's the same with EMFs. Like we talked about creating EMFs. You're, you're talking about a tribe that's lived there for a few hundred years and then now the land's been taken. And you think that that energy's not going to still reside there when a tribe lived there for a few hundred years. But, it, but once again society demonizes the tribe right oh they put a curse on the land it's their fault they have to blame somebody not that's not how it works the energy was already put there the energy was already placed there and then it was taken over and then the land feels disrespected and then weird things happen like you know earthquakes tornadoes whatever oh it's the curse of the of the native americans no you're disrespecting the land buddy why don't you take accountability for what you're doing also, the weird stuff was probably already happening, and the people True. who were there already, they knew how to work around it, work with it, and everything, and then other people come in, and they're like, oh my god, all this stuff, and they're like, we told you. But also, you I'm not saying it's not possible either, of, you mm-hmm. know, uh, like in this case, you see a chief, his entire tribe being slaughtered, and then he's murdered. It is not impossible for his last dying words to be like, curse you all, 100%. You took my land, you raped my women and my people of my clan and my tribe, and now you're about to murder me. So yes, I'm going to curse you. It's not impossible. How would you feel if that happened in your neighborhood? Same thing. You know what I mean? But the time period too is like you have you have um, people moving west, the colonies moving west, and basically this is this is where the the bullshit comes about, where you have. Treaties being made and broken, like, at a whim. They're like, oh, yeah, you, you get this land. We'll leave you alone. And then they move in. They're like, no, no, we're actually going to scoot you more over. We're going to take this. You get that. Treaties and it's are like, still being broken we... today in South Dakota and oh, North yeah. Dakota. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, wait a minute. There, there was a binding contract. You can't just keep moving the border or the line wherever you want it to be. Mm-hmm. But that was happening. And like you said, it's even happening today. Mm-hmm. Where it's like. No, no, we really want this, so we're going to continue to scoot you over. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, it's not. Or just, in general, cause harm totally to your entire ecosystem. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, it can it can be disastrous. So supposedly mm-hmm. his dying words were, I was the border man's friend. Many times I have saved him and his people from harm. I never uh, ward, ward with you? Ward with you. But yeah. only to protect our wigworms and the land. So he's basically saying, I was trying to get along with you and protect the land. He says, I refuse to join your enemies with your red coats. I came to the fort with a friend, then you murdered me. You have murdered by my side my young son. So his son was obviously murdered with him as well. And for this, may a curse of the great spirit rest upon this land. May it blight by nature, and may it even blight by hopes, by the strength the people paralyzed the stain of my blood. Um, yeah, I'm not shocked. Not at all. This is also, I would kind of, if I would take more time to, I would want to research, like, the the time frame from then up to the 90s, because I would be more curious, like, has there more stuff happened before the bridge and everything? Because it's like, I feel like that would be, like, a a sequence of bad things happening, Mm -hmm. not just, like, oh, one big bad thing. It would be probably a sequence of things. Do I think it's related to Mothman? I mean not the bridge Mm -hmm. now could once again going back to my theory from before could mothman be somehow related to the indigenous and then be a part of this curse due to like i said indigenous worshiping creatures that fly with with feathers absolutely i mean in in smudging saging however you want to word it processes um you use eagle feathers that are usually um mulched by the eagle left behind and abandoned they're blessed by uh, you know people of the tribe and that's what you use so feathers that's why mothman sticks out to me so much is feathers are such a big thing with indigenous so for this creature to be flying above is he part of the curse of like quote watching over the land after the chief was murdered that's an absolute possible possibility in my opinion 
Now, once again, do I think Mothman stuck himself on the bridge and shook it off so it broke to get back at the people for killing the chief? I think that's a stretch. That's a big yeah. stretch. I, I, I think I would fall, I would lean more towards faulty technology and just age than the supernatural thing. Also, we haven't even gotten into the whole part about the UFO sightings and the men in black and just... All the layers. <laughs> well, yeah, this area, which is interesting because a lot of those hot spot areas, and this is one of them, mm -hmm. same thing in Arizona when we filmed. It was like everything in one place. Literally, like, we think we experienced hellhounds for the first time. Um, we were like, there was a tribe that had been slaughtered on their own land. Um, there was uh, miners that died, you know, in the in the mines, and they were, their bodies were never recovered. And then on top of that, you have UFOs. And you're just like, it's, oh, yeah. it's weird how it, it does make, is it the ley lines? I don't know. Is it portals? I don't know. Is it interdimensional areas? I don't know. But it does make you wonder why these certain hot spots do attract or accumulate these like paranormal things. Well, I think with the UFOs, it's like, I think partially I could see it being some sort of like manic or attracting because like you said, like you have the... Alaska Triangle, you have the Bermuda Triangle, you have these weird kind of hot spots to get around. But then you also have to think, too, back to the TNT area, you had um, a TNT military base, you had military around in that area. So, And that usually can attract UFOs and UFO sightings as well, wherever there is military or military activity. So even if that place was defunct, doesn't mean it would stop UFOs from coming around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That was the same thing, too, with Antonito, Colorado. There was, like, uh, we were there to investigate this, like, that was the one where the um, library burned down by the, like, it was well, so weird. But then they had a UFO watchtower, and then they had, like, La Llorona, wow. like, supposedly chilling down by, like, the, the river, and I'm like, the Banshee's mm -hmm. here, too? Like, Jesus, they've got everything in one spot, you know? And then there's, like, over the hill, well, the reason they put in a UFO watchtower, there's, like, cattle mutilations going, and you're just, like, and there's, there's literally 700 people that live here. Why is there so much, you know, like, but it, that's proof of maybe they're attracted to areas where there is low population so that they're not seen. Yeah, no, I can, I actually, I agree very much the idea where it would make sense because you probably wouldn't want all that stuff going in a heavily populated area like I don't know, Chicago or New York and everything, a small populated rural area would make more sense, really. But Vegas, we have, well, Area 51, <laughs> they're literally, I'm in, like, a group chat with my neighbors, and, like, every few days, like, did you see the UFO last night? Yeah, it was hovering right over here. You know what I mean? Like, it's just so, like, a part of Vegas. Vegas is its own little beast. It, it's its own different. It is. Like, it, like, you talk to locals, like, oh, yeah, Area 51. Like, oh, yeah, there's aliens. It's fine. Like, it's just so, like, a part of the community. Like, nobody's, like, you're, like, okay. Like, when I first moved here, I was really off put by it because, like, aliens aren't, I mean, rural Colorado, like, there's alien stuff, you know, but, like, here it was just like oh yeah they're just their spaceships just look out like and like everybody chats oh did you see the ufo yeah sharon i saw it last night and you're just like wow you people are like the vegas strip with all the lights and everything they're like yeah it'll be fine it is like, <laughs> like blending in you know what i mean like, yeah, yeah, no think much of it it's so true so oh my god it's so good well what about final thoughts anything on final thoughts there's Final thoughts so on much. going there. You want to go back. You freaking loved it. Oh, totally. Not in I, winter or, like, fall, obviously. I would say go, like, spring or fall, like, before the extreme weathers and everything, just, just to survive and everything. And I would love just to go to this festival. Like, honestly, the Mothman Festival sounds awesome. I think so, too. We'll have to do Cause, that. And there's so much. Like I said, we, we've only, like, scratched the surface of this of this event this place and everything and i don't know i kind of i think i want to lean more towards like either nature spirit or interdimensional being mm -hmm. so that would that probably be where i would lean more meg towards said it. could mothman be a skinwalker i've heard they're shapeshifters i talked about this earlier i don't think like you know when you're talking about um skinwalkers in indigenous culture 
like I mentioned earlier, it's that's dark. It's usually like dark witch practice, depending on which tribe you're talking to. Um, like I know with the Navajo or like Southwestern tribes, like they take um, the skinwalker very serious. Usually it was like an ex shaman or an ex druid or someone that practiced healing magic in the tribe that essentially turned to the dark magics. Do I think Mothman is that? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think Mo- like a skinwalker is considered bad because they can lure you into the forest or lure you into the dark or the mountains and then they kill you and they supposedly um, do worships on animals and like goats or whatever. So no, I don't think it's a skinwalker. Could Mothman be related to indigenous? Possibly. I think it's like Elfie said though, like, it's probably more interdimensional. And I think it's more of like chaotic neutral of it's protecting the land. And I think that's why when we've seen images of him, I'm not saying it's infinite him or her or or it, whatever. Um, I think that it comes out to warn us when something's happening, because if you are talking about some sort of indigenous spirit, which at the end of the day, Elfie and I, I think we're agreeing that it's somehow related to the earth or like nature or, or something like in the wild or protecting the animal, something nature which is indigenous at yeah. the end of the day that's not going to be a violent creature even if it's real or if it's just a spirit that's just being protective and i think when it comes out those are just warnings if people have claimed to see it and people that are saying it was threatening maybe they were threatening it you know what i mean like i feel like sometimes you don't really know the truth behind those stories when people like elfie saying i need more context you're saying you're driving down the street and mothman's flying over your car and, and it's scaring you and it's really close and threatening well what happened before that like elfie said was it was it hunting or are you in territory that you shouldn't be in like i mean especially something that large it probably ha- would have a very large hunting territory radius too is it a shapeshifter though i don't think it's a Mm. shapeshifter i don't think it's a shapeshifter yeah i don't think any reports ever talked about anyone seeing it change form or anything it was just more like wings large red eyes when you say interdimensional i i think it's similar to like chupacabra that's why i think we get these bursts of people seeing it and then it disappears. So does that mean that it's going back to its, like, caves where Elfie was about to go? Because yeah. I'm just so jealous she did that. No, not necessarily. If it's interdimensional, it means it could be, it leaves and comes back or whatever. Like, maybe it's it has a bond with the planet. Maybe it has a bond with the chief. We don't know. But maybe there's, it goes into cave caves. Yeah. I mean, yeah, literally. Mm-hmm. Like, what if the, it, maybe it's in the Smoky Mountains or the Appalachian Mountains, like, and there's a home up there. We don't know. Like, we said earlier is there more than one i think there's so many interesting theories that you could go off with this and there's no infinite answer because we don't know and that's i think what makes us love paranormal so much because and this is why i love elfie and cat this is what we do we sit around like wait what if it was this you know what i mean or like what if it was that and like that's what Mm -hmm. makes these theories so fun and then elfie's like okay Googling, researching, <laughs> like <laughs> finding it right now. You know what I mean? I'm going to see if we have any more questions. I'm not sure. Um, no, I think that, I think we're good. So that was it. Yeah. I think this was an awesome stream. I'm so happy you finally got to share it. And, um, someday we are going back there for sure. Yes. Uh, don't, I can't wear platforms. So no. And... <laughs> And, like, we need to make sure we have, like, a medic on set just in case. Because I am the one that will, like, get eaten by, like, a werewolf. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm that girl. I am the blonde that will die. That's why I'm always saying there are some cryptoids I will not investigate. I don't. Do I want to go find Bigfoot? Not really, to be honest with you. You know? Do you want to find Bigfoot? But I think that would involve some, like, having to do camping and really uh, getting into it. Camping is like, no, a five I don't do that. Star don't do the hotel. I need an outlet for my flat iron, and <laughs> it's just not going to work, okay? So you got to rough it. You got to wilderness for that stuff. Uh, see, <laughs> we'll just use Josh Gates for that. You know what I'm saying? That's there all. you go. But um, thank you guys so much for being here. It was great. Next week, um, Kat and I are going to chat. I don't know. You know, we always have weird chats, so I think... Yeah. She's doing, well, I don't remember what she's doing, but I know we're going to also kind of have a chat about Destination Fear next week. 
we have some really strong opinions on the last few episodes of Destination Fear. And um, I'm going to save that one for Kat, though, because (laughs) Kat just is ready to share her thoughts with you guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, she can't control it. (laughs) And, um, but yeah, life is good. Everything's really good. This will be uploaded as a podcast, as always. Make sure you're following us on social media. I know that so many of you want to know what's going on. Uh, I know that I've gotten private DMs from you guys, and there's tweets at me, and and uh, let me just tell you that life is good, and uh, we are in a beautiful spot at Ghost Girl Diaries right now, and it's everything I could have asked for, and as soon as we can talk about things, we will, and until then, we're doing podcasts, and we're on TikTok, and TikTok, I have not, I didn't film this week for TikTok, I am so bad, I've got to stop that, oh God. American Horror Story characters. Thank you, Kat. I forgot. Yeah. She's really excited. Oh, that's so. going to be so much fun. I know. I know. Oh. I know. I was like, I bet you Elfie's so really going to go down the hill with this one. Like, she's going to be like, oh, my God. Cause there's... How many pages do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and this is why we love Elfie. You know what I'm saying? Because you see the library behind her, quite literally. That's just Elfie. That's her thing. That's just a little. Yeah, that's just a little. Yeah, if we ever do <laughs> fan events. She just wants books. She likes mm-hmm. ancient books, old books. Don't get the new ones because she probably already owns it. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so she she likes old collectible creepy books. But um, yeah, um, this will be up updated as a podcast. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, Elfie. This was badass. Oh, I enjoyed it. This was so much. Oh, fun. I w- I've been dying to hear you. Just like I just wanted to listen to you and like your. Oh God. And so you just want to hear me rant. <laughs> final thoughts. Do you think the area is like haunted too? Like, do you think there's, or do you think it's EMFs? Do you think it's, um, uh, por- portals? Like, what do you think the whole area is? Do you think there's something just there? I think there's something there. I, I do. I think it's like, I do think it's haunted. I mean, heck you can even go with the idea of like, uh, the, the minerals under the earth and everything. So I think there's, there's enough, Spooky stuff that happens both in Point Pleasant and around it. That there, there's something up. There's something. Like we would need to like take some time to really investigate the whole area. Honestly. Really, just strange, mm. strange energy. Oh yeah. Were the people friendly? Yeah. Oh yeah. They were. Okay. Oh yeah. They were. They were very. They were. If I remember correctly, they were friendly and respectful and everything. It's just honestly, like I said, it's how you approach and how you approach them as human beings and everything. Mm-hmm. So don't go in and be like. Is Mothman here? I'd like to talk to him right now. <laughs> yeah, don't don't be a jackass. <laughs> yeah, don't walk. Well, yeah, that happened on set. I had somebody walk in, and they're like, "So the entities? Do they know they're dead?" And I was like, "Jesus, Jesus!" Like, really? God. <laughs> I mean, we'll get there, but like, jeez, very brash. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Make sure you tune in next week. Will be really good. AHS chat, um, American Horror Story talk about destination fear follow us on social media you know the drill please go vote for my dog on twitter (laughs) and uh have a great weekend guys we will chat with you next week bye guys back from the dead